Hello, welcome to the April 2017 Nutritionist Webinar. I am Marianne Fezenden from AMTS and your English language host. These webinars provide access to technical seminars by internationally recognized speakers. The series presentations are held in English, Portuguese, and Spanish. Marcos Nieves Pirere from University of Federale de Lavras will be hosting the Portuguese language presentation with Marcelo Hentz Ramos from 3R Lab facilitating. Paula Torillo from Argentina is hosting the Spanish language webinar. There will be a post presentation question and answer period when listeners can submit questions through me, Marcos, or Paula. A complete recording of the archived webinars as well as a question and answer session for each will be available on the AMTS website. We are very pleased to have Dr. Mark Hannigan with us today for the April edition. Dr. Hannigan is a professor in the De Department of Dairy Science at Virginia Tech with responsibilities in research and teaching. Before joining Virginia Tech, Dr. Hannigan was a dairy research manager for Land Lakes Purina in St. Louis, Missouri for 12 years. His formal training includes two years as a postdoctoral assistant in the Department of Biochemistry and Biophysics at the University of California, Davis, a PhD in nutrition from the University of California, Davis, under the direction of Drs. Lee Baldwin and Chris Calvert, a Master's in Animal Science from the University of Cal Davis, and a BS in Dairy Science from Iowa State University. Prior to attending Iowa State, he owned and operated a 50-cow dairy in western Iowa for six years. While at Land Lakes Purina, Dr. Hannigan worked on development and refinement of whole animal model of metabolism in lactating cows. At Purina, he also conducted lactating cow, growing heifer, and calf research at the Purina Mills Research Facility. In his position at Virginia Tech, Dr. Hannigan has continued to work on the regulation of nutrient metabolism and developing models for of metabolism. His work also focuses on excretion regulation through precision feeding. Dr. Hannigan, the floor is yours as soon as I turn it over. Dr. Hanneman, Hannigan, you should be good to go. Okay. Can you hear me all right? Yes. All right. Very good. Well, it's a, it's a pleasure to speak today. And uh, so the, the topic today is, is sort of maybe a, a question that that one might view as somewhat flippant, but uh, because we've all been exposed to this idea that there is a single limiting amino acid and, and for that matter, a single limiting nutrient. But so I'm asking the question to start with, is there really such a thing, and particularly uh, rel relative to lactating ruminants? And, uh, you know, it's always important, I guess, to recognize the, the funding partners for any of these efforts, and certainly USDA uh, gets very cranky if we don't uh, recognize their funding. So up front, <clears throat> this work was at least partially funded by USDA grants, uh, both in the past and, and ongoing. So it covered the, my litigation-type things for, for now, anyway. So why would we be interested in this. I mean, there's a number of reasons, and uh, at least uh, probably the one that's first and foremost for most of uh, the people listening would be the fact that there's actually uh, income and profit associated with this. And so if we uh, can do something about either reducing our expenses by reducing the amount of uh, nitrogen or protein that we're feeding in the diet, or we can perhaps increase our income by better balancing that diet to deliver more milk per unit of feed cost, then we enhance our profitability for the dairy. And of course, I don't think there's probably too many dairymen, <clears throat> regardless of, of the country, that uh, would turn down extra profit. From a longer term perspective, I mean, we do have to be also concerned about the efficiency with which we produce food. There's only a certain amount of land in the world, and uh, as human population continues to grow and is expected to, to peak out at more than 10 billion people, we're going to place more and more pressure on our ability to produce food from that given set of acreage. Now, there are additional acres that can be brought into production, but the um, ability to do that is, is somewhat limited. And um, a lot of that land that's not in productive use today, or at least some of it, 
uh, is not very high quality land. So we, by the time you look at the quality of the land, the available moisture that's there to support crop growth, and um, the ability to move material in and out of that uh, area, we don't have a lot of extra capacity that we can bring into production. And so there, there will need to be greater efficiencies in terms of managing how we grow our crops and grow our food to try to alleviate existing levels of food insufficiency <clears throat> as well as covering the um, additional population that's going to be added. And we're going to have to do that in, in an environmentally friendly way, which means we need to at least maintain or, if possible, reduce our environmental loading. And so I have some pictures here of various problems from an environmental standpoint, including water quality. And it's, this is a big issue in our area because uh, a lot of Virginia is contained within the Chesapeake Bay region, and, and that's been a, a waterway of interest in terms of improving water quality for a number of years. But from the nitrogen side, probably air quality is, is a bigger issue. Um, we can certainly manage our <clears throat> nutrient runoff fairly well if we, if we pay attention to our agronomic practices. But unfortunately, a lot of the nitrogen that the animal is not using and is excreting is not actually captured in that manure that we might gain some value from by applying to crops. The vast majority of it is actually blown off as ammonia into the air. And that's of, of concern because, uh, as it's sort of demonstrated by this picture, which is from the Central Valley of California, this mountain range back here is barely visible, even though it's only about 10 to 15 miles away, because of all this haze that's in the air. So it was a perfectly sunny day that day. but And this haze is, is being generated largely from the combination of ammonia and sulfur and nitrogen oxides that are being emitted by cars and power plants, et cetera. So the two of those combine and catalyze the formation of these very small particles, which not only make the air hazy, but also cause, or at least appear to cause some significant lung problems in humans and appear to be contributing to our increased incidence of asthma. So from a human health standpoint, it's important to try to also gain some efficiency in terms of our nitrogen feeding. And then lastly, the, you know, the climate is warming and um, certainly greenhouse gases are contributing to this. And at least a portion of those are coming from nitrogen, although that's, it's a fairly small portion and it's mostly land associated. In other words, it's the, the nitrogen oxides that are coming off the land. And so whether we apply manure or not to the land, um, provided you're providing, you're applying nitrogen, either in the form of fertilizer or manure, you're still going to have some nitrogen oxide emissions from that land. So we're not necessarily contributing from a nitrogen standpoint very much to, to climate change uh, from an animal standpoint. And so if we look at it from an efficiency standpoint, and these are sort of typical North American diets uh, or production systems. And so on average, you know, the North American lactation or, or uh, dairy industry ends up, you know, somewhere between 25 and 30 percent efficient in terms of gross nitrogen efficiency. And so when I speak of gross nitrogen efficiency relative to a product, what I'm speaking of is the proportion of dietary nitrogen that would be captured in the product, so in our case, milk nitrogen. And so then when you look at growing beef, it's dietary nitrogen, the fraction of that that's captured in tissue nitrogen. Or in, in egg laying, then it would be dietary nitrogen that's captured in the uh, eggs that are being laid each day. And so by difference then, what's not captured in productive product is excreted in the manure. Okay? And as I stated in the last slide, a good share of that nitrogen it is blown off as ammonia into the air and contributes to that hazy air quality problems. So 25 to 30 percent, you know, there's you see some herds now, particularly in, in North America, as the price of uh, crude protein is, is increased over the last you know six to eight years. 
that might be operating up as high as 35%, but that's really, uh, you know, seems to be the upper limit from a industry standard uh, point that we're achieving. Growing beef are about the same. If you look at swine, then they actually, as an industry, are, are operating at about that 35% level. And again, this is, you know, more than 10 years ago now. But they do have the knowledge, you know, based on their knowledge of amino acid requirements to achieve much higher efficiencies than that. And so they settle in, you know, between 35 and probably 50%, depending on the relative costs of the the uh, synthetic amino acids that they can add to the diet and the cost of the protein from natural uh, ingredients such as soybean meal, et cetera. And so that those pricing or that those prices sort of dictate what efficiency they operate at. It's not lack of knowledge that's keeping them from operating at a higher efficiency. It's just a, an economic decision. And by and large, it's the same with the uh, poultry production, whether you're looking at eggs or, or, or growers, broilers. They can operate at higher efficiencies than this, depending on what the economic forces are that are in place. But for beef and dairy, we really, you know, I would position at least today, we don't have the knowledge to, to make large gains on this. So the question then arises is, can we not get to, you know, 60, 70 percent efficiency because the animals inherently can't do that? I mean, certainly ruminants are different than monogastrics, and perhaps they're just inherently inefficient in handling nitrogen. Although you can look at examples, for for example, when animals are grazing low-quality grass, uh, particularly animals that, uh, you know, like zebra, or I guess that's not a ruminant, but if you look at ruminants, gazelles, et cetera, that are on uh, low-quality grass, you know, where you, they're only able to get 4 or 5% protein in their diet, they're very efficient at, at uh, recycling waste nitrogen back into the room and capturing that, and they can tolerate a very low uh, nitrogen diet as compared to what we're feeding uh, cattle these days in our production systems. So the question is, is, is if it's not really the animal itself that's inherently inefficient, then are we not able to, uh, to reach those higher levels of efficiency because the models that we're using to develop our diets are inherently biased. And so pictorially, at least in North America, one can't go to, to the first year of school without being able to demonstrate that you can put a, a round peg in a round hole. Okay, if you, if you consistently try to put the square peg in the round hole, then you're gonna be told, or your parents are gonna be told that you need to wait another year to go to school. And so I question, or at least I wanna raise the question, you know, are we, are we failing to make progress because we fail to realize that our model is more like a square peg when in reality we need a round peg to go into the round hole. Certainly you can, if you look at the efficiencies that we generally achieve out of uh, the production systems using the models that we have, we're you know largely probably getting about 70% on average of the nitrogen that's consumed in the diet absorbed as productive amino acids. It can be up higher, and certainly we have the knowledge to, to achieve quite higher levels than that. And if we then look at the just a straight transfer efficiency, if, if we're only getting 70% absorbed and we only capture two-thirds of that in uh, milk protein, well, then we're down already to, put to about 50% as our maximum efficiency. And that doesn't even count the losses that we're going to have to invest into maintaining that animal. And so by the time we account then for maintenance and some reproductive losses perhaps in, in, in the later, latter part of, uh, of the lactation cycle, then we're now down in that 30 to 35% range, which is where we operate at. So one, we have to pay attention to improving our efficiencies of the supply side. In other words, taking more advantage of the ability of that ruminant to recycle nitrogen and to you know keep the protein levels in the diet low. And then we have to also question, you know, is this representation of the requirement system truly an accurate and, and robust representation 
of the animal system. And so if you think about it a little bit from a, you know, a, a fairly famous saying, if we're going to use that system, which is what we do, and we bolt our amino acid requirements on top of it, and if our hope is then to achieve greater efficiency by taking and making use of that amino acid knowledge, if we just use it bolted on top of the old system that, that yields about a 30 to 35% efficiency, expecting to get a better answer or a different answer is essentially Einstein's definition of insanity. We can't keep doing the same thing over and over again and expecting to get different results. And so those of you that have heard me talk before, I'm sure have probably heard me use these two quotes or seen me use these two quotes because they are my favorites. And they are my favorites and continue to be so because I haven't found any other ones that I can use um, to replace these two to provide a little diversity. Because these two essentially speak, I think, to the topic for today. And so from Mark Twain, who is a famous North American uh, writer, it isn't so astonishing the number of things that I can remember as the number of things that I can remember that aren't so. And from Will Rogers, who was a humorist, it isn't what we don't know that gives us trouble. It's what we know that ain't so. And so these exemplify the point I was making in the last couple of slides, which is, are we not able to feed for 60, 70% nitrogen efficiency or greater because our conceptual representation of the system is wrong? And we don't, we don't know what it should be, and so we, we think we have a good system, and that's what's giving us trouble. So if we really want to move forward and, and see if we can achieve better results, then essentially I think we have to dismiss where we're at now and start over again and probably work from an amino acid basis rather than a nitrogen and a crude protein basis. So if we sort of start at the beginning, and, and this is where it comes back to this idea of a single limiting nutrient. Von Liebig, you know, we, we all have been exposed to this water barrel with the uh, broken off staves and the concept that, you know, the lowest stave is going to dictate the level of water that, that can be achieved in that barrel as an analogy for our production um, abilities or our, our ability to produce product at a given level of inputs. And I know from experience in terms of, of uh, lecturing in different places that everyone, or at least it seems like most students in North America are taught this. Uh, when I've given talks in South America, they shake their head that yes, they've been you know, taught with this uh, barrel analogy. The Asian students all shake their head, the European students all shake their head, the Australian students all shake their head. So the only continent I haven't checked yet would be Antarctica. And since we're really not worrying about feeding the penguins that are there anyway, I suspect maybe the, there may not be knowledge of the, the barrel and the stave in Antarctica, but it's also not terribly pertinent. So this, this actually is credited with, with von Liebig, okay? but, but really the, the actual concept that underlays this, this conceptual representation began with Sprengel, who was another German uh, plant physiologist that predated von Liebig by about a generation. And he observed that if there was a soil nutrient uh, that was required by the plants of study, that if it was limiting in, in concentrations in the soil, that it would limit plant growth. And when that was the case, and, and you could determine that by adding more of that nutrient, and you could observe then increases in plant growth. And that when it was limiting, the increase in plant growth was proportional to the supply of the nutrient that was added to that soil. So this is a concept that you know, certainly is well based in, in our whole um, representation and also our whole concept of how we determine limiting nutrients. The challenge probably isn't from Sprengel's original observations. It's, it's a little bit more from von Liebig's. Okay? And so he, he added on to that concept a little bit by stating that you know, if a nutrient is limiting, 
not only will growth be uh, respond to that nutrient, but it won't or can't respond to another nutrient. So, for example, if, if we need you know phosphate and nitrogen to grow maize, for example, and if phosphate is limiting, von Liebig posited that adding more nitrogen to the soil would not result in any, any change in plant growth. One could only add phosphate to get a change in plant growth. And the reverse, if nitrogen was limiting, then adding phosphate would do no good, even if phosphate was limiting. And so he, he or, or at least this ended up being coined the law of the minimum. Well, we already had the laws of thermodynamics by that time, and so certainly it was recognized you know, well before that that you can't make or destroy energy or, or matter for that, uh, you know, from that, those concepts. So certainly, um, if we have in, in the area that's um, covered by the roots of a plant, if there's 10 grams of nitrogen available that could be extracted, well, then we can't get more than 10 grams of nitrogen deposited in that plant. Okay, and so by rights, that's the first law of thermodynamics, and that would certainly be consistent with a law of the minimum in that uh, where our growth is going to be minimized or it's going to be restricted by the total supply of the nutrients that we need to deposit in those plant materials. Where it's then further comes apart is Mitchell and Block, of course, were the ones that actually did come up with this barrel and, and stave concept. And they used that, and, and by the 1940s, of course, the amino acids had been discovered, and so it was recognized by that time that animals had requirements for some of these amino acids, and so they were, they were trying to develop a concept, a conceptual framework for understanding <coughs> how one would deal with these multiple of amino acids that had to be required and considered. And so they, they came up with this concept of the barrel with the staves and the order of limitation in that, in this case, if methionine is the lowest stave or the lowest, provides the lowest allowable production, then that is the most limiting amino acid in this conceptual framework. And applying von Liebig's law then there's no sense adding lysine, even though lysine is, is limiting in terms of what the potential, if the, if the potential of the animal is up here above 150 or 160, then clearly lysine is limiting in that diet. And their conceptual framework stated that there was no sense adding any lysine to the diet because methionine would, is limiting that growth and, and nothing can, res, nothing or the animal won't respond to any other nutrient other than methionine. So this is the, the point where you know I invoke um, it's not what we don't know that gives us trouble, it's what we know that ain't so. And so I wanna, I wanna sort of draw back and say, okay, well, are these really the facts? In other words, is this really how biology works? Or do we have a flawed conceptual framework? So I'll start off with some animal level observations and then I'll drill down to some tissue and, and cell level ones to ask that question. So here's a study that was published out of our group, you know, a number of years ago now. And it's it's and I'll admittedly state up front, it's difficult to do these studies at an animal level to challenge that conceptual framework. But this was our sort of our first attempt at that. And so we designed diets that that it's a two by two factorial. So we had high and you know, what we called high energy and low energy. It was probably more realistically moderate energy and low energy. And then high and low protein. Okay, and so the diets were 1.54 megacals of NE per kilogram or 1.45. And they were 11.8% MP, which if I remember correctly was about 16.5% crude protein or 9.5% MP on a, as a percent of dry matter, which if I recall was about 13% crude protein. So if we take the low, low diet and as our negative control, it supported a, a little over 25 um, 
kilograms of milk a day. And the high high as our positive control supported about 37 kilograms. So the herd manager at the farm wasn't very happy because a bunch of the cows were producing at least 10 kilograms per day less than what they could have been producing. If we added then to that negative control uh, protein, then we got a, about a five kilogram response. If we added energy instead of protein, we actually got about a seven or eight kilogram response. So by von Liebig's law and, and Mitchell and Bloch's representation, if we got an, a significant response to protein, then we should not have been able to get a significant response to energy. Or vice versa, if we got a significant response to energy, then we should not have been able to get a significant response to adding protein without adding energy. Okay, so these are independent additions. When we added protein, we didn't add energy. When we added energy, we didn't add protein. And if we added both together, then we got a, a, a larger response. And essentially, statistically, when you look at this, there's no interaction between energy and protein. Each addition was independent, and they were roughly additive. The two independent responses roughly added together to the two together. And you can see that efficiency of use of MP was greatest when we fed a high energy, low protein diet. And it was the least when we fed a high protein, lower energy diet. And the milk, urea, nitrogens, and blood nitrogens follow that very same pattern. So this suggests, and again, the statistics are not as strong as one would hope. You know, if we had run another iteration, then presumably we would have gotten it you know, below the 0.05 level. So if you're willing to accept that this is a significant response in terms of protein, then this flies in the face or, or dispels von Liebig's law of the minimum. Came back a couple years later and with help from uh, Ivanik and, and, and Balchem, we did an amino acid study <clears throat> using protected amino acids which uh, Ball Chem protected for us, and uh, Ivonic and, and I think Adiseo do donated some as well. So we looked at, again, a, a positive control, which was a higher protein diet, and a negative control, which is a 15 and a quarter percent crude protein diet, and then the addition of individual amino acids, so methionine, lysine, leucine, or methionine plus lysine, methionine plus leucine, or all three, to that negative control diet. Well, this was somewhat of a disappointing experiment because we ended up with numerical responses to all of the individual amino acids, but none of them were significantly different from the negative or the positive control. So when we looked at them together, there was a significant response to amino acid, but of course we were wanting to, to demonstrate that the addition of one amino acid, so for example, if this had been a significant response to methionine, if we also got a significant response to lysine or to leucine, that would again dispel the concept of a single limiting nutrient. Um, this is a more recent study that, that's unpublished yet. Uh, Michelle Aguilar is just finishing her PhD, and so this was her PhD work, and so we, we came back and tried it again uh, based on some more extensive cell culture work, which I'll come back to in a little bit. And we looked this time at isoleucine, leucine, methionine, threonine. So same credits, Ivonic donated uh, you know, the amino acids. Balchem protected the isoleucine and threonine for us. Uh, we used Ivonic's uh, methionine product. We, uh, we were more diligent even than the last time in that we screened all four of these for bioefficacy. So we determined up front what the absorbable fraction was for each one of those. And then we fed for absorbable uh, amino acid supply. And so we fed a high protein diet as a, as a negative, I mean, I'm sorry, as a positive control or used it as a positive control. So we looked at an MP deficient, sufficient one. And then we provided the amino acids to meet that at 100% sufficiency or at about 90% sufficiency, or at 75% sufficiency, or at greater than 
the uh, sufficient diet. So this was a, a dose response experiment. This is showing dry matter intake because we wanted to see whether or not if we saw a milk production response, was it due to dry matter intake? And of course, particularly with like methionine, if you overfeed methionine, you can get an amino acid imbalance and lead to a reduction in intake. So we did the dose response mostly to check intake responses here with the idea of doing a factorial experiment as a follow-up to this. You can see the only amino acid that we actually did get a response to was actually a positive response to isoleucine, which was not expected. And so it raises the question, is a, is a normal maize lucerne type diet based on maize grain and, and soybean meal supplementation, do we actually perhaps have a slight amino acid imbalance just in our normal feeding conditions in that we end up by adding isoleucine, perhaps it's too far out of balance relative to the other amino acids, and the addition of that simply stimulated intake. That wasn't the, the goal of our study, and, and we were a bit surprised to see this, but it does raise that question. So obviously the target then was to, to see whether or not the independent additions of these generated any significant responses that were independent of one another. And so the design was um, a large replicated block design. So each block uh, uh, was one amino acid, and the blocks were replicated by amino acids. So we had three blocks per amino acid. And so we're looking at responses within each block of cows using a Latin square design. So we ended up, uh, the diamonds here are, are threonine. And so we ended up with a what appeared to be a, a saturable dose response to threonine, as you might expect uh, one would see if, if you were truly limiting. Also, a response to methionine, uh, at least a numeric linear response to isoleucine, and this very strange sort of quadratic response to leucine. So when you look at the isoleucine, particularly if you take out the uh, effects of, on dry matter intake, there was no significant change, okay? So this linear increase likely is driven by the dry matter in increase. If you look at leucine, it was, it was significant both for linear and quadratic, but of course the linear was negative and the quadratic was positive. So it's a, a little hard to interpret that one. The methionine, we're sort of back to like the last study where we, we have a, a strong trend for both a linear and a quadratic response. And same way with threonine, you know, strong trend or at least a trend for a linear and a quadratic. So again, you know, at least numeric and, and trending evidence that uh, there were independent effects here, but still not the um, <clears throat> the smoking uh, gun, I guess, that you would like to see to dispel that whole concept. If we turn to a modeling approach, and, and I realize this is a very, very, very busy slide, but um, I want to focus mostly on the, the numbers that are highlighted in red here, and I'm not trying to cover anything up. Essentially, what we did is we looked first at how well did the NRC model perform using this minimum allowable milk concept. And uh, I don't have the N here, but it's like 500 and some diets over the last 30 years. So a huge range in, in dietary conditions. The numbers in red then give you an idea of how well that model works. So you have all, this, all these responses to all these different diets. Does the model actually predict those responses well? Well, it covers about 63% of the variance. It will predict a, a milk protein and a milk yield. Actually, a milk yield, it doesn't, the old NRC doesn't do a milk protein prediction, but it'll predict a milk yield with essentially a 23% error. So if it predicts 35 liters of milk a day, that's plus or minus 23%. Now, Robin went through a whole series of, of um, corrections to this model, trying to identify where the problems are, and these papers are in press. In fact, they may be coming out in, in this month's uh, Journal of Dairy Science. 
but clearly there was some bias in the digestion calculations. So we were getting biased representations of supply. So she corrected those problems. And when she did, then gained about five percentage units on the concordance correlation coefficient, which is like an R squared. And we reduced our root mean square errors, in other words, our prediction errors from 23 to 21. So a slight improvement. Also, although not highlighted down here, there was a lot of slope bias, and I'll show you that in a figure in a little bit, to the, to the old model. And at least half of that, if not more, was due to these problems with adjustability. If she then changed the conceptual framework for representing energy and amino acid efficiency or protein efficiency, and for the protein efficiency, she used this equation up here, which I'm not going to go all the way through other than it's sort of a saturable function, which is a function of arginine, histidine, isoleucine, uh, lysine, methionine, phenylalanine. And the last two, I can't read because it's a little big for me, but are threonine and then valine. Okay? And then we had a net energy term that came in as well. These terms were all significant. Okay, she, she did a, a backwards elimination and a forward addition both, and these are the terms that stay in the model. So it's saying that the efficiency of MP use is not a static 67%, such as represented in the NRC model. It's a, it's a, it's a variable um, efficiency, and it's nonlinear. In other words, it, it becomes less and less efficient as we add more and more to the supply. And that efficiency is a function not just of MP, but of the supply of all of these amino acids and the supply of energy. So when she adopted that, she gained about another, you know, she gained quite a lot in the CCC and dropped the errors of prediction down to about 16 and a half. And when she tried it on an independent data set, it reproduced. So it wasn't just some artifactual derivation from that data set. So if I drop down to the bottom half of the table and I look at this, so basically after fixing the model, this is the best we can do still largely within the framework that we've operated in. If we then change and we say, well, let's forget about this minimum, in other words, this single limiting nutrient, and let's just take the average of the energy predictions and the MP predictions and see where we get. And so you can see based on this fixed model that we gain quite a lot again in precision. So we now go up to 93% precision and we're predicting our 35 liters of milk with only a 10% error. So when I contrast that with the current state of affairs, 60, you know, 63% precision, 23% errors to 93% precision and 11% errors, this is a huge step forward. So it really is now arguing from a model standpoint that we have to consider independently and additively all of these essential amino acids plus energy. We can't drop this into a framework where we consider just one nutrient being solely limiting as von Liebig and Mitchell and Block laid out. So here's what, here's what they sort of look like at the start, you know, the initial. So you can see lots of slope bias and so I constantly forget to orient people to these slides, but this is a standard way of representing model prediction accuracy. So um, you, you place the predicted uh, values on the y or the x-axis, and on the y-axis, then we have two things here. We have the residuals, which if the model were perfect, uh, and a residual is calculated as the observed minus the predicted. So if the model perfectly aligned with the observed for every one of these data points, when we subtract the two, we would get a zero. So a perfect model with no variance, with all the data points would line up along this zero line. So as we predicted from milk yields of 10 kilograms per day to greater than 60 kilograms per day, we would see them all lined up along the zero line. And so obviously we're not going to have zero variance, so there's always going to be variance around this, but it should align with that zero line. 
And of course, we have this large slope bias that I pointed out before. We're over predicting milk production at high production. We're about right at low production. And on average, we're over predicting by about 10 kilograms. And so you can sort of see on the top up here with the dark color, the black ones, that these are now the observed values plotted against the predicted. So you can see that the observed values are higher up here than, uh, than the predicted are, okay? So we got a 50 versus a, a 40, okay? And so when we go through then and we look at, that's energy allowable. If we look at protein allowable, we still have the same bias. If we look at the minimum allowable, this is all with the, the, the NRC 2001. We still have the main, same bias, okay? And, and doing the minimum allowable doesn't actually do better than either one. And if we do the mean allowable, it doesn't really help that much. But if we then fix all of the problems in the model, and we look at the energy allowable, we can see that we've gotten rid of most of the slope, and they're, they're largely aligned with the predicted. When we look at the protein allowable, we've, we've made significant progress, right? We've got a fairly tight alignment now compared to protein allowable up here. If we do the minimum allowable, we actually make it slightly worse. Okay, so we would be better off ignoring energy and just looking at protein than looking at the minimum of protein and energy. But if we then do the mean allowable, it actually makes it slightly better. So from a model standpoint then, pretty strong evidence that we should discard this minimum allowable nutrient concept. Okay, here's some more data. Back to animals but now in very small cows, okay? Little fuzzy 15 gram ones, all right? So this is a mouse study. And we did a preliminary study with this to begin with to, demonstrate, to establish um, that mice litter weight gains. So we had litters of mice that were suckling a dam and we were feeding the diet then to the dam. And so we, went, we actually went from like 9% protein in a preliminary experiment to 26% protein at three protein unit increments. And we established that at about 21% dietary protein, pup litter growth was maximized. And that at 15% crude protein in the dam's diet, litter growth was significantly reduced. And what we saw at about 9% crude protein in the diet and below that, the dams ate all the pups, and so we had no litter weight growth nor any measurement ability. So we chose 15 and 21 as our negative and our positive controls. And then just like the cow experiment I showed before, we added individual amino acids to that low protein limiting diet to see whether we got independent responses in litter weight gain. So you can see first off that the litter weight gain at the 15% protein diet was 67 grams over, I think it was a 10 day period. And on the 21% diet, it was 85% or 85 grams. And they were significantly different. Okay, and this was uh, the student that did this, uh, you know, I forgot, I think she has 10 litters per treatment. So she, she was very um, aggressive in making sure she had a lot of replication. If we add leucine to that limiting diet, we ended up with significant gain of about 11 grams of litter weight gain. Okay, so the, the diet is exactly the same other than the, the addition of some leucine to it. And if we, rather than adding leucine, we add isoleucine, we get almost exactly the same improvement in gain. And if we add methionine, instead of adding isoleucine or leucine, we get exactly the same increase in gain. And if we add threonine, we get no increase. So this is probably our cleanest, you know, in vivo representation or test of that Mitchell and Block concept based on von Liebig's law of the minimum. And clearly, it, you know, it dispels that concept, that theory, 
Okay, it's called the law of the minimum, but really it's a theory of the minimum because it was never really demonstrated, okay? So we can get independent responses, and of course, if we add protein, which is adding all of these, we get a greater response, which was significantly better than the addition of any single amino acid. So it's very consistent with that conceptual framework that I showed with the energy and the protein additions where we have independent responses to each amino acid, and adding more than one amino acid yields more than one response. <clears throat> and this is, you know, we'll, we'll dig into this just a little bit, but essentially when you look at all the cell signaling, I mean, she, she did a very thorough job of sort of looking at the mechanisms. Between the gene expression changes and the cell signaling changes, these growth responses are largely explained by the mechanisms at the, at the tissue level. So these were all within mammary, <clears throat> the cell signaling and, and uh, gene expression were mammary values. If we go back to some modeling, and this is actually what started me on this, this uh, path a number of years ago. We were looking at mammary arteriovenous difference data. So we had measured arterial blood flows and the concentrations of all of the main nutrients in the blood and venous outflows. And so we, had, we knew exactly how much the mammary was taking up. And we were working on a model to represent how that mammary metabolized and also produced milk components. So I've excerpted just the amino acid side of things and the milk protein here. We knew by that point in time, with uh, some fairly clear experimentation by Brian Beckett, that there was some kind of feedback inhibition or activation from within the cell <coughs> that helped regulate uptake of these amino acids from blood. And essentially the way it works, whether it's an activation or an or a inhibition, I'm not sure. You know, the exact mechanisms have not been demonstrated completely yet. But essentially if the supply of histidine, for example, in the cell was much greater than was needed for producing protein or could be gotten rid of by catabolism, then the concentrations, of course, would increase if, if it kept taking out more than was needed. And this acts to feedback inhibit transport activity. So for a reverse, if we're short of histidine, and this is actually what Brian did in his experiment, he made the animals severely deficient in histidine, concentrations fall within the cell dramatically as the mammary gland struggles to continue to make milk protein and it draws down the concentrations, and that relieves this inhibition, and it activates transport. And so we knew that at that point in time already when we were building the model, that the models only worked if we had these feedback inhibition representations for all the main amino acids. And so that was coded in, and the model would represent about 85% of the variance in uptake. So it did a very good job of that. However, when we then coded you know, a representation of that limiting amino acid concept to predict milk protein output. We explained about half of the variation in milk protein output that was observed based on a large literature data set. But when we restricted the evaluation to only studies that had been done within this project at, in the United Kingdom that we were, we were working on, where we had done quite a few studies with either single or amino acids being infused into the jugular vein or small groups of essential amino acids being infused, it actually completely failed. It way over predicted responses. Um, it just explained essentially zero variation in the observed output in response to those infusions. So when we looked at, at the errors, essentially they all pointed to this idea that this single limiting nutrient or amino acid wasn't the appropriate representation that we really needed to represent it as a multi-limiting amino acid. And when we did that, when we expressed it basically as a saturable function with independent and additive effects of, of at least these amino acids in the same form that, that Robin used for her more empirical um, fix for the NRC model, our explanation of variation in the literature data set went up significantly 
and we went from zero variation explained in the smaller data set with large variations in individual amino acids to explaining about half. And when we examined the errors in, in these predictions, the remaining error was highly correlated with energy, which we had ignored. We were only building the amino acid side of this first. And so we, we know that energy and some of the hormones do affect this as well. And that was reinforced by this. So again, another piece of evidence that this single limiting amino acid concept doesn't hold water. And cell culture-wise, here's some really old data that, that really wasn't, um, the implications of it weren't really even discussed in the paper, but this is actually out of Virginia Tech, out of probably the same lab I'm in today, but they took mammary explants, put them in a minimal essential media with very limiting amino acids, and to that negative control, they added individual amino acids one at a time. So this one only contained the added histidine. It didn't contain additions of methionine or anything else. They got numerical responses to all the essentials and significant responses to methionine, threonine, and cysteine. The cysteine methionine could be explained by sparing effect, but not the methionine, threonine. So in 1978, there was already evidence at the cell level that that single limiting nutrient concept doesn't hold. Here's some work by Sebastian Areola, who was a graduate student with me, and he, he looked at the responses to valine, isoleucine, methionine, and threonine in a large central composite design. So he looked at five concentrations of each in this design, so all the dimensions are, are present in the design. So if I could show you a five-dimensional graph, then I could put them all into one, but I can't, so I'll show you two three-dimensional ones leucine by isoleucine effects on casein synthesis rates, and we were measuring alpha S1 casein directly with mass spectrometry um, methods. You can get a response in terms of casein synthesis to adding isoleucine, and it's saturable. Okay, we, he used uh, quadratics to do this, but it really desaturates and plateaus. Or in those same cells, you could add leucine and get a response. And of course, if you add both together, you get an even greater response. Or you could add methionine and get a response. Or you could add threonine and get a response. And where I've drawn these arrows are sort of the middle of the in vivo, or I'm sorry, the upper end of the in vivo ranges. Okay, so th these are these responses, at least in terms of blood concentrations, are in the in vivo range. So essentially, you can lay a halo on here at, for example, a roughly 3% fractional synthesis rate. And there's an unlimited number of combinations of isoleucine, leucine, methionine, and threonine that I could use to get the same output. So again, no single limiting amino acid. Your choice then of what combination of these four, for example, you would use would be dictated by the price of them. So if, for example, threonine is cheap and methionine is expensive, well, I would use less methionine and use more threonine. If isoleucine is cheap, I would use more isoleucine. So if we can encode this conceptual framework in our models, then we can be like the swine industry today, where we're, we're choosing to operate at a lower efficiency, not because we have to, but because it's economically favorable today. And we can be comfortable then that if we have a large increase in, the, in economic penalties, for example, or as the food and feed supply tighten up because of increased pressure from human population growth, that as those ingredients change price and as the value of our product change prices, we can operate anywhere in this framework and, and make sure that we maximize our economics. And I think that's the key point, is rather than trying to draw a single point on these umbrellas where we have a requirement, we need to make sure we just have the response curves correct. I don't know what the best solution is going to be, even for any of all of you today. I won't certainly know tomorrow. It all depends on your local prices. So that's really the direction we're heading, is trying to get these models reconfigured 
so that they become response models rather than requirement models. That's not to say there's not a requirement, but there's not a single requirement. If I can substitute and get partial effects of substituting methionine for threonine, that negates this idea that there's a single requirement for methionine. There's a best solution for the combination of methionine, threonine, isoleucine, leucine, dietary energy, et cetera, that will give me the best economics today and that will change tomorrow as soon as the prices change. But I shouldn't worry about that as long as my models can adequately represent those responses. So if we're going to move forward, you know, we have to, I think, challenge this idea that we have this single limiting nutrient theory and, and we can represent it at least uh, conceptually with this barrel and stave that doesn't really represent our metabolic knowledge. Um, perhaps this will be lost on those that uh, aren't aren't getting you know day to day updates you know from tweets from our our illustrious president at the moment. But I would I would position that uh, you know based on a very famous quote here recently by one of his underlings that these are alternative facts. Okay, this is not how it operates. We can continue to limp along and make this work, or we can focus on trying to get something better, okay? So for example, I mean, we can, you know, my analogy here is that, you know, if I need to write a letter home to mom or write an email, you know, I can tie one hand behind my back and I can tie all the fingers together on the other hand and I can put a blindfold on and I can turn around backwards and maybe I can still type a letter to her and send it by email, but it's not gonna be very effective. And so why would I want to continue to hamper my abilities by sticking with a framework that clearly doesn't match our biological um, system that we're trying to represent? We've tried to reduce this con concept of where our requirement is for a given amino acid, lysine in this case, by restricting it you know, to only diets that, that have adequate methionine according to our model, We've ignored the other amino acids. We've ignored the clear interactions with energy. We've under, there's some underlying biology that we've ignored. And yes, we can make this sort of work, but it's not going to work well. And we've probably already have maximized the, the accuracy we can get out of this system. And I can say, you know, out of five tries, I think we've now taken it at uh, getting a reproducible lysine deficiency model so we can just study this stuff from a cellular level. We only have significant responses to lysine in one study. So this isn't even a, a coin toss. I can bet against getting a lysine response, at least in my hands. Um, maybe some of you are better and have figured out, you know, which buckets you need to have your feet in to do this. But... Um, I can't get a significant response to lysine in a reproducible manner with the models that we have today. That's not to say that the cow doesn't have a lysine requirement. And clearly, you know, we, we are getting responses to lysine. What it's saying is that our models are so poor that we can't rely on them to tell us when we do need to add lysine and to have confidence that we will get the expected response. So if I just summarize sort of that, that idea of a simil, single limiting nutrient, energy and MP, you know, clearly have independent and additive responses. You know, we can use room and protected amino acid supplementation. We have the ability to do, you know, essentially all the amino acids. When we've looked at them, at least, you know, the evidence together, when we start putting studies together, are that there's independent and additive responses in cattle. We clearly showed independent and additive responses to in amino acid supplementation in lactating mice. We clearly have shown independent and additive responses in mammary cell cultures. I didn't show very much of that other than the one study, but we have a number of studies looking at that. The animal level modeling shows independent and additive responses to energy and amino acids. The mammary level modeling shows independent and additive responses to amino acids. So, you know, what's, what is the real mechanism that's causing this? And if we understand that, 
we should be able to build a new model from ground up. Okay, and, and we've already essentially are, are doing that now. And it really just revolves or, or becomes a function of how that cell works. And essentially there's one key regulator within the cell on the uh, protein side, although the, this is also involved on the, on the lipid side. And if you recognize that alpha-lactalbumin, one of the milk proteins, is required to make lactose, this almost can become a key regulator for the whole mammary milk protein output. And it's mTOR, and it's called mTOR because it's, it, which stands for mammalian target of rapamycin. And rapamycin was a drug that was discovered quite a number of years ago that was found to severely inhibit protein synthesis regardless of cell type. And this is a, a key regulator of protein synthesis. It acts through a variety of proteins that act directly on the translational mach machinery, and it responds to amino acids. And so not only are amino acids substrates for making protein, they're regulators of protein synthesis. So when you get more amino acids, you have more substrate, and you generate more regulatory signal to tell the translational machinery to make more protein. Not only do they regulate that, but as I pointed out before, they regulate transport of amino acids into the cells. So if there's too much of an amino acid, it inhibits uptake. If there's not enough, it enhances uptake. So this is not a constant efficiency system. It also regulates blood flow. Okay, and we don't understand this completely. But when we have a deficiency of a single amino acid, blood flow goes up dramatically to provide more of that amino acid. Glucose and acetate feed into the TCA cycle, generating ATP and keeping AMP levels low. If AMP levels rise because there's insufficient energy, it acts on AMP kinase, which then eventually inhibits mTOR. If the body's low on energy, then insulin and IGF-1 concentrations fall. If they fall, they remove the inhibition on this protein, which then inhibits mTOR. Okay? So we end up with amino acids, energy, and hormones all acting through the same system to regulate protein synthesis, and they all act independently. So it's not surprising that we get independent and additive responses to each of these. So that's the biology behind it. We know that at the cellular level. We've demonstrated it at the tissue level and the animal level. We've demonstrated it with modeling. So uh, you know, all we have to do is boil this system down into something that we can actually deploy in field software to solve this problem and get better quality. So just to back up the cellular work just a little bit, Here's plus and minus amino acids and plus and minus acetate. Uh, if we take out the acetate, AMP kinase goes up, mTOR goes down, and protein synthesis goes down. We can either add acetate or we can add amino acids and get the same response. So the, the two in-betweens are you know, either in response to acetate or in response to amino acids. If we take both out, we get lowest. If we put both in, we get the highest, so independent and additive. Same way for amino acids and insulin. Very same response. I can either add insulin or I can add amino acids and get a response in mTOR. The modeling side then, we built this up into a, a tissue or at least a protein synthesis model. The models work fairly well. We don't get a lot of precision in predicting casein synthesis, but we essentially get no bias. Okay? When, we, when we manipulate acetate, glucose, individual amino acids and insulin, we can predict the responses with no mean or slope bias. In other words, even though we have a lot of variance in making these measurements, the model suggests that we have the con concepts correctly represented. And when we encode, we can start building that into then a, 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 an animal level model, okay, that is made up of some, some more mechanistic elements as Adeline's doing right now, she's just about done with this, we end up with significant 
effectors of arginine, histidine, isoleucine, leucine, phenylalanine, threonine, and valine. And we can we can predict um, milk protein output with about a 10% error, so twice as good as um, the old NRC model does. The worrisome part is obviously we're missing like methionine and leucine out of here, or isoleucine. But when we use larger data sets, those actually become significant as well. And so here's mathemat or, or pictorially what it looks like. Um, predicted milk protein yield along the x-axis. <clears throat> Residuals in red lining up along the zero line like they're supposed to. Observed in black. And so good concordance between the predictions and the, and the observed in terms of the um, milk protein output. And she has a, con you know, a, a concordance correlation of 93% and a uh, overall root mean square error of 7 or essentially 8%. So if we can build this up into something that we can put into ration balancers, which is what we're working on now, you should be able to go out and go on to farm and have confidence day in and day out that you can manipulate multiple amino acids and energy and the other things that you need to do in terms of ingredients and not fail to predict uh, outputs. And that gives you then confidence that the rations that you're solving for from a least cost standpoint will in fact perform as you anticipate. And so they really will be optimal uh, solutions rather than hoping that they work as you anticipate so that you actually don't uh, get thrown off the farm. So if we get rid of our alternative facts and, and start thinking about how do I take my barrel and staves and water and, and get it back into some conceptual model that, that I can use to help explain this, I'm not there yet, but at least this is one iteration or at least a starting iteration. So rather than you know broken off staves you know, with water pouring out over one, we need to recognize we have a lot of staves, not only amino acids, but you know energy and, and other things. And every stave has some leaks in it. Okay, and so we're, we're constantly leaking water out of this barrel. And the higher we raise the level of water in the barrel, which means the more nutrients we're putting in, of course, the more pressure we're gonna put on, you know, create in that barrel, and the faster these leaks are going to leak. But as we raise the water in the barrel, we're also going to start putting out milk protein. And the higher the level gets, the more we can put out. And so the concept is we need to work on plugging leaks or reducing the size of leaks. And the leaks get bigger for a given one if we have inadequate quantities of other ones. And so if we can start plugging these leaks, then we can actually reduce the amount of waste in the system which will allow us to reduce the amount of inputs to the system while maintaining our output. So in our leaky barrel concept, more nutrients in the barrel is going to lead to more milk, but more, more in the barrel also increases the pressure and, and the volume of the leaks. And the size of the, each leak is depending on the mix of nutrients. And if we plug any leak, it helps. So we don't have to look for the biggest leak and plug that. Plugging any leak will help. Plugging big leaks helps a little more than little ones. Plugging more leaks helps more, and plugging all the leaks helps the most. So if we get all the leaks plugged, then maybe we can be like the 85% uh, efficient pig. We've reworked our amino acid supply model. Um, that's gained marginally in terms of precision and accuracy, or provided gains in, in pre precision and accuracy. We do have a new post-absorptive response model developed. Um, we're, we're trying to finalize this and get it published. Uh, it's more mechanistic in, in framework. We're going to also try a more empirical approach. We're relying on our ability or our, our collection of data at the tissue level. Multiple amino acids will drive milk protein. And this provides major gains in accuracy and precision. We've got commitments from several ration balancing companies to adopt these, this system. If we can get it boiled down to, to a field level model, which we've demonstrated that we can, and if it provides real gains in accuracy and precision. 
We also have renewed fund, uh, funding from USDA to support this, so we're anticipating going out you know, and, and providing um, a replacement for the existing framework that will actually yield some really positive forward movement in accuracy and precision that should lead to economic gains in terms of, of you all doing your job. So conceptually, out with the old barrel, in with the new. Uh, law of the minimum eventually takes hold, but uh, we got lots of extra nutrients floating around in here that uh, we can grab hold of and put into milk protein. We've got independent effects, variable efficiencies. Unfortunately, everything's nonlinear, and so we're going to have to, you know, most of us most have moved away from using linear programming to solve these. We're going to have to rely on nonlinear optimizers, and we got great potential for improved uh, efficiency. On the practical side, I mean, you know, the, the, the supply model is pretty good. Our response model is about done, and we got commitment and funding, as I indicated before. So the take home from this, unfortunately, I wish I, I you know, could have provided some economic evaluations for you. We're, we're lined up to do those next month. When uh, Marianne and I talked about this last summer at meetings, I was hopeful that we would be through with the economic analysis by now, but as everything goes, always slower than you would hope. So today, take home message, do what you're doing probably already. Feed high energy diets. And if you do feed high energy diets, you can probably feed less protein than what you're thinking you can. Certainly your model's probably over predicting protein requirements on those high energy diets. So don't be afraid to take a little protein out of the diets. Uh, the, if you do lose production, you're only going to lose about uh, half as much as what the model says or even less than that. So it's not as bad as what the models make it out to be. And the best amino acid and protein mix is going to depend on cost when we go forward. So I think that's the end of my, uh, you know, my presentation. So again, acknowledgments to a lot of uh, funding uh, over the last 15 to 20 years. Uh, a heck of a lot of collaborators, and many of these are still, you know, working with us. A lot of students, uh, both uh, graduate and, and uh, you know, a few postdocs mixed in, and uh, this sort of herd of undergraduate students that uh, are too numerous to name. Without everyone's efforts on this, you know, I wouldn't be able to speak to this today, and we wouldn't be on the cusp, I think, of of providing a, a large step forward in terms of our ability to, to balance rations with, uh, with confidence. So I'll turn it back to, to Mary Ann. So first of all, let be sure to join us next month for Dr. Ian Lean, Managing Director of Scribus, a company that conducts research and consults to dairy and beef producers within and outside Australia, and an adjunct professor at the University of Sydney. Ian has extensively published on the interactions of nutrition with production, reproduction, and health. He has been a keynote speaker at numerous international conferences presenting on those topics as well as on meta-analysis and study design. He has researched transitional physiology, metabolism, and management for 30 years and has worked on impacts of integrated nutritional strategies on health, production, and reproduction. Ian's talk will be Nutrition of the Transition Period and the Special Challenge of Pasture at this time. Last year, we had a lot of requests to see if we could pull in some um, speakers on pasture, and we, we obliged. Save the date and time. We're going back to the second Wednesday, and it will be at 6 p.m. again. Sorry for anybody listening in Europe and South Africa, and it's Eastern Daylight Time. I want to thank our sponsors. Um, first of all, the people who make this possible, Tom Taluki and AMTS, USA and Global, Marcos Neves Piera, University of Lavras, Marcelo Hens Ramos, 3R Lab, Brazil, Paula Torillo in Argentina, and the translators who work in both those locations. We have generous sponsors that make it possible to get great speakers and manage the program. We thank our gold sponsor, Ajinomoto Heartland, Superior Nutrition through Amino Acids. Our silver sponsors are Arm & Hammer, Animal Nutrition, R&D Life Sciences, Virtus, makers of Strata with EPA and DHA Omega-3s and Prequel with Omega-6s, Cumberland Valley Analytical Services, Dairy One Forage Laboratory, and Dairyland Laboratories. Our bronze sponsors are Jeffo, Life Made Easier, 
Adiseo Amino Max and Quality Liquid Feeds. I'm going to open the floor up for questions. If you remember in the English language listeners, please type it in the question and answer window. Um, Paula will ask questions for Argentina, and we do not have any questions being asked from Brazil today. So I'm going to let um, Dr. Hannigan have the presentation back. So if he needs to go to a specific slide, he can. I do not know if Paula has some, so I'll give her an opportunity to ask. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. Uh, okay. I have a question from Carlos. Uh, which would be the the level of amino acids you would recommend? Hmm. Well, it, as I was hopefully trying to make the point, it, it depends on the rest of the diet. And um, so I, I think that uh, the, the targets that we're trying to hit today probably, are, you know, in terms of maximizing milk protein output. So, for example, um, uh, you know, the, the 7.2 for lysine as a percent of MP and uh, 2.2 or 2.4 for, for methionine, those are, are probably at the upper end of the response range for those amino acids. Um, I think, you know, just to, to back up a little bit, while we tend to, to hang our hat on those as a percent of MP, we're never going to get high efficiency if we continue on that route because that route already sets MP at that level that's going to generate a lower efficiency. So we have to back up and start expressing our um, requirements in grams per day. So you would have to then convert that, and, I, and honestly, I, I can't do that off the top of my head here, what what that would equate to. But that level of, of methionine, for example, probably is going to maximize production given a standard diet. But if you improved uh, amino, there may be one or more other amino acids, like, for example, the addition of that isoleucine, that enhanced intake, that might allow you to feed less methionine. So it really does boil down to understanding, I think, all of these to a to certain level and then putting prices to it. Because if methionine is really cheap, then you might feed lots of it, more than you would typically feed because the marginal return will become less and less as you go up to higher and higher supplementation. But if methionine is really expensive, then you're probably going to want to stay down on the curb a little farther and try to do other things in the diet to get milk yield and milk protein yield up. So not a very you know, satisfactory answer, I'm pretty sure, but it, it really is a complicated system. Like I say, we, we hope to have equations you know, that we can start deploying in the next six months or so. And in that case, then he'd, I, would, I would just say, well, you have to pull up your software and see which one works best for you. So. And uh, related uh, with this, how would milk yield affect the expected response in production? Going to struggle with that, I think, for a while because we tend to always want to look at these things in very high levels of milk production. As you come down in, in milk yield, you're, you're more and more likely to be able to, <clears throat> to provide a greater share of the amino acids that are required just from microbial protein and, and the standard amount of feed protein that it's escaping. So at least conceptually, I think most of us would, would tend to agree that <clears throat> the use of, you know, of added amino acids is probably going to be more important in high yielding cows than in low yielding cows. But that's not to say that there wouldn't be opportunities. I mean, again, if the diet is is sort of narrow and, and maybe it's not well suited from an amino acid uh, supply to complement the microbial proteins, you could perhaps still get good responses to one or more amino acids at, at low milk protein. So again, it comes back to sort of getting a model finished that we trust and, and then trying to see whether or not... Uh, um, you know, we get the same kind of responses, or are they are they lower responses in in lower protein or lower uh, yielding cows? But we know both have requirements. It's just drawing the the line of where their sort of relative requirements are. Okay, Paula, can I take a couple? 
Yes, please. All right, I'll give you a chance to do some translating. Thanks. Okay, I have one from Sam Fezenden. Um, your take home is that energy and protein can be considered independent and additive, yet energy in some form ends up a significant term in some of your response modeling. Does this mean they're related? Um, what, it, what we're saying is that um, you can't run protein synthesis without energy. So you can have, even though it's not a, a direct substrate, we have to have ATP, for example, if we go down to the cell. And we only get ATP by oxidizing things and, and providing, you know, oxidizing and uh, generating the ATP that's needed. So you can think of energy as sort of like an indirect substrate for protein synthesis. Without energy, we don't have the, the reducing power that we need to create the bonds between the amino acids. So if you go back, walk that back up to the animal level, of course, if we feed a low energy diet, we're not going to get very good milk production. And that's going to not just be because we can't produce lactose and fat. It's also going to be because we can't produce the energy within the mammary uh, glands to actually, to actually synthesize that milk protein. And since the regulatory mechanisms respond to both energy and the amino acids independently, the lack of provision of either one of those will dampen milk production and vice versa. The addition to either one will make it better and we can add either one and we'll get an independent response. So um, they're, they're related in that the actual mechanism of synthesizing protein requires both. Um, I have a second, I have another question. This is from Robin Rasty. Um, should we be looking at essential amino acid levels in addition to the usual methionine and lysine, and should we be looking at them in relation to energy, as in percent ME, or as rash, or relation to ME versus MP? I think that's what she meant. Um, absolutely yes to the first answer, because they're, they're clearly, uh, like I say, I, when we, we've focused on methionine, isoleucine, leucine, and threonine, not because they're the only ones. And we've not focused on lysine because from a cell signaling standpoint, those first four give the largest unit responses. And lysine does actually re, um, impact cell signaling and therefore the regulation of protein synthesis, but it's not a very potent one. It's, it's, it's quite a ways down on the list. And so we're focused on the top four, thinking that we have the best chance of seeing uh, significant responses in, in animals when we go back to that. Plus, we can't study all 10 at once. I mean, the size of that study that Sebastian did was really large. I mean, we literally had a herd of, you know, I think there was 10 or 12 undergraduates, four or five graduate students, you know, all working on that study whenever we would kill a cow and, and prepare tissue slices. So we've screened all the amino acids. They all have, a, all the essentials have a response. It even looks like some of the non-essentials do. So this idea that only methionine and lysine are the important ones is clearly not the case. So yes, we have to pay attention to those. The second part of the question, because energy and protein are related, if we were going to ratio to anything, we should ratio to energy, not MP. If we ratio to MP, we're never going to make any forward progress because we've already set our dietary crude protein level at like 15 and a half or 16 at a bare minimum, right? Maybe 15 on high intake cows. If we take the approach that we're going to start with amino acid requirements, much like the swine industry does now, where you've got grams per day, or they'll ratio it to ME in the diet, we ought to be able to get down uh, to 11 or 12% crude protein diets and get the animals up in the 55% uh, efficiency range. But to do that, you know, that's not going to be economically feasible today. The cost of the amino acids is high. But again, it, we don't know what we're going to need to do 20 years from now. So we do need to gain that information so that we can understand how to do that. From a statistical standpoint, making it a ratio of ME is a bad idea. Okay. Not from a conceptual standpoint, but from a, con a statistical one, because you're, you're predetermining what that ratio should be, right? You're giving each one equal weight. 
so if you'll if you'll look back through the slides, you'll see that, that the two or three times that, that energy shows up in our slides, we're always treating it as an independent variable with its own coefficient. And so while conceptually ratioing to ME is the right thing to do, statistically you don't want to actually do that ratio. You want to give it its own coefficient so that we can actually give it in, you know, independently derive the effects of each individual amino acid and ME. And I think that'll give us the best model. And certainly that's one of the options we're looking to, uh, going towards. So once we get done with all of our derivations, then I can probably answer that, you know, with an exact, uh, example. But I can, I can tell you that certainly I'm opposed to doing it as a, as a direct ratio to ME. And absolutely I don't want to see it as a ratio to MP because that's not going to allow us to go forward. Okay. Robin says, thank you. I have a comment and a question, and then I'll see if Paula has some. Um, so the first one is from Diana Allen. She says, thank you. And do you remember her from the snowball, snowball project at Rowett? I do. And I haven't heard says, from her in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> well, she usually listens to us in the middle of the night. So I think she's rather grateful that it's at 6 p.m. in the U.K. And she says all the best. Um, the question that I have is from Yanting Chen. Do you think the gross nitrogen efficiency of dairy cows can be up to more than 40% because it's rare to see cows that are able to get more than 40% gross nitrogen efficiency in wide range of types of rations or efficiency increase can only have a very limited potential, do you think? And then we'll go to Paula after you answer this. I think I think we can get higher than that, but it won't probably be across a wide range of diets. I think it'll probably be, you know, as we get higher and higher in gross efficiency, it'll be a narrower and narrower diet until we get, of course, to the maximum where we'll have probably, to, you know, it'll be a single diet. So um, as an industry standard, I would say, no, we're probably not going to be able to get above 50% gross efficiency uh, on a wide range of diets, given the different um crops that we would have to feed in different regions. But I think we need to at least gain the knowledge to be able to, to get up and, uh, you know, well above 50. We're going to hit a, a max, you know, and it's going to be less than swine because running things through microbes is, is losing some efficiency. And, uh, and we may not be able to maximize production at the same point that we maximize efficiency. So, it will really depend on on economics as we go forward. But yes, I I don't think 40% is the barrier. I think we can get quite a bit above that. Yes, I have another question from Carlos. Uh, Should we feel confident regarding amino acid content in feed, like corn silage or hay crop silages, with very different food protein levels among them? Um. No, we have to know what they are. Um, maybe the the broader question, and perhaps that's what what he's asking, is that can we rely just on on tabular values? Uh, clearly, the composition of of the amino acid composition of corn silage is not the same as as a legume. Um, the problem is is that analysis is time consuming and expensive, and so there's there's no way that we're going to probably, at least given current technology, be able to get a, for example, an NIR calibration for the amino acid composition of corn silage so that we can, we can in real time adjust our formulation for every corn silage that we're using. We're probably going to be stuck for the foreseeable future in analyzing for crude protein and then using tabular um, amino acid composition values for corn silage to um, predict what our supply of each amino acid is. But we do have to follow that through because it's it's looking like there's probably not a huge amount of remodeling of that um, rumen undegraded protein fraction in, in terms of its amino acid composition. In other words, the composition of the of the protein in the base feed that you're feeding seems to be somewhat close to what comes out in RUP, but I'm sure there's examples where as soluble proteins leave, they have a lot different composition than the insoluble proteins that remain in that in that feed and pass out of the rumen. So um, 
I think we can we can get down the road quite a ways just by looking at tabular values for the composition of, of amino acids in protein and feeds and assuming our RUP composition is reflected by that. But eventually we're probably going to have to find at least some of the examples where that composition is in RUP is not reflective of the feed composition and account for those in our system to gain additional progress in terms of efficiency. Okay, um, Paula doesn't have any more questions right now. I have another one from Sam. He says, thank you for your first answer. In your opinion, are energy supply predictions good enough to move to the amino acid ratio energy recommendations at this point? Well, as I, you know, on that very busy table that Robin White had generated, <clears throat> the existing ones that we're using in the field today, no, they're not good enough. I mean, they're, they're pretty good, but uh, there certainly was some problems in them. And actually, almost all the problems seem to have uh, revolved around <clears throat> challenges with representation of digestibility of the individual nutrients. So I think, I think each of the major proximates were, were off some. If you correct those, then actually it does tighten up quite a bit and it removes a bunch of the bias. And so I think if you fix those problems as, as is laid out in Robin White's paper that'll be coming out very soon. Yeah, I think it does have the precision that we probably need to, to be able to ratio to it. Well, just to, to come back to Diana Allen a little bit, uh, yeah. I hadn't heard from her in a long time, but yeah, that, that early work, you know, the modeling work that I showed with the memory stuff was out of that Snowball project out of the UK, which the uh, Milk Marketing Board at that time was a funding partner in, and so Diana was in, involved in that. So. Terrific. Um, I guess unless somebody types something rather quickly, I'm going to thank you for a wonderful presentation and um, hope that everybody enjoyed it. And for that, we will sign off from this webinar. Thank you, Dr. Hannigan. It was great to listen to you. Thank you very much for everyone's time today. All right. Thanks very much. Goodbye, everybody.